Welcome everyone. I would like to welcome you to the next in the series of our Infinity Group Infection Control Targeted Education to help you with your infection control journey with that COVID infection control project that you have going on currently or are planning to start up. You're in for a treat this for this educational session. We do have the topic of personal protective equipment and Melody is Brown is going to be your speaker for today. I'd like to turn it over to her so Melody, the floor is yours. Thanks, everyone. We are very grateful that you're taking time out of your busy schedule this afternoon to join us as we talk a little bit about protect, personal protective equipment and all of the challenges that you are facing today as you face everything with COVID. I am Melody Brown. As Julie said, I have been with Alliant for some time. I'm the AIM manager for patient safety as well as one of the team members for the QII process that we're currently doing with a lot of nursing homes with one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, a quality improvement initiative. Today, I hope before we're done that you will uh, be able to describe and understand the type of PPE to be used according to the resident isolation or non-isolation at this time. And I do understand that you're having a lot of changes as many of you are going to a status of COVID free and having no COVID uh, positive residents in your nursing home as well as staff. Also some key strategies for the selection of PPE and understand how to locate information via links given for the latest updates for PPE. I'm going to refer to several different uh, resources, but at the very end of this slide presentation, which will be available on our website as soon as we are done, if not before, uh, I have given a whole sheet of resources at the very end, so you will have all of the links and have access to those for everything that is referred to today. In addition to that, I'm very happy to tell you that we have two peer stories that uh, will be shared today, and uh, so we're going to look forward to hearing some good best practices and lessons learned from the field. So let's think about, as, as you have had to think about since March, a whole new mindset of who actually needs PPE. So patients or residents with confirmed or possible SARS-CoV-2, or as we know it now, coronavirus or COVID-19 infection, should at least wear a face mask when being evaluated medically. Healthcare personnel, so your staff, should adhere to standard and transmission-based precautions when caring for residents with COVID-19. I want you to have some considerations during this time to know that uh, these slides were prepared two weeks ago, so I'm going to put a disclaimer out here to tell you that ch things can change. So the next bullet I would like for you to pay close attention to because uh, that is probably the best reference I can give you today for keeping updated on the uh, infection control guidance that you will need in selection of PPE along with other guidance in your journey as you go about treating residents and taking care of residents with COVID-19, and that is uh, available on CDC. Again, I have provided the link for you at the very end on a page of resources, but uh, if you look for any resources whatsoever, most of them will take you back to this guidance. And so uh, it's a, a pretty big uh, paperwork that you can go through and uh, disseminate and take the information from this guidance for what you will need for the resident that you are caring for and what meets their needs at the time. We all know that there are different types of PPE to be used in healthcare settings, and I'm almost positive that probably the majority of you that are on the call today uh, might not have even had some of the materials or the uh, resources that we are now using today in stock back in March, and now it's a common everyday usage item. Uh, that includes, but we know that you had gloves and uh, gowns and aprons, but we've had to really think through what type of gowns and aprons to use, uh, where do you use the different types, cloth versus even all the way up to some of the Tyvek suits. Uh, masks and respirators are still a challenge in some areas, and so again, I'm going to refer you back to that infection control guidance as you make a selection. For your N95 mask, whether you use those, the K95 mask, how you cover the mask, possi uh, very possibly, 
Uh, also, thinking about fit testing and when do you fit test, when do you not have to fit test. Uh, that goes along with your respirators as well for your N95 mask, the K95 mask, goggles to protect the eyes, and, and face shields. Uh, face shields probably came into light a little bit later on, but uh, they're very effective and many different kinds that are out on the market today as the picture depicts right now. Here are some with like eyeglasses that you can wear as well as some that have the bands around the head. But it is, they are uh, very good to protect the face, mouth, nose, and eyes. And uh, so just add that protective covering. Make sure that in reading the guidance and looking at that, you want to make sure that in addition to a, a face shield, you may also need to continue to wear the face mask and the different types of face masks. I've, did a, I've done a screenshot um, when to caring for uh, confirmed or suspected COVID-19. There are a couple of things on this screenshot that I want to bring out to you. And again, you have the link for the full sheet. And this might be something that you consider now using as some states are opening up, and I may say that more than once today, but as some states are opening up visitation for families and members coming from the outside. You want to make sure that with your PPE, that uh, all of your staff are receiving comprehensive training on when it is necessary, how to put it on and take it off, and the limitations, the care. There has, has been a lot of information out there for you on the care and when to change mask out and what to do, and then most especially how to dispose of your PPE, where to dispose of it, and then You've had to make decisions of where are you going to put your disposal canisters and cans and things like that. Now I would like for you to kind of turn your attention toward when you open your buildings for visitation and what you're going to be expecting for your family members to wear and making sure that they understand that before they get to your building. And also with your staff, you want to demonstrate competency, competency in performing the practices and procedures. And if we've heard many times, as we've heard many times, doffing and donning still is an area where um, a lot of staff members are not necessarily getting it right according to your policy and what your policy states. And so, you know, I, I do love to set folks up to do audits and uh, that's one good way to be able to make sure that once your competencies have been completed and you've had everybody in and, and gone through a competency fair or that time when you have them in for in-services, but it's also a really good idea whenever the, uh, your staff are out working with your residents to do some random audits. And I like really to use the random unannounced audits so that you see the real picture of what's going on out in your building. Uh, in addition to donning and doffing, we are hearing a lot now as buildings are beginning to have less COVID uh, positive residents and staff in them, that the staff is feeling a little bit better and they're wearing the mask, but they might not be wearing the mask appropriately over their nose. So here again is a great opportunity for you to take a little bit of time maybe and do some um, look and audit of what's actually going on in your building. I put this in and I realize it says 10 ways healthcare systems can operate effectively and there are only three on here. But, um, you know, I would ask at the very, at the end of this presentation, whenever you have the slides available in that resource page, that you actually go out and take a look at all 10 of the, um, the ways that Healthcare systems can operate effectively during this pandemic, and we know that we're several months into the pandemic, but it might be a good time now, as some folks are able to kind of step back a little bit and take a breath of, you know, what did we really just go through, although it's not over, but what did we really just go through, what were our intense times, and, you know, how did we respond, and how do we do, and what maybe could we do better? if we had to do this again, and we certainly hope that that's not going to be um, the, the norm anymore. One of the things I would ask that you do, too, is think about as, again, you open your buildings up for families to come in and other people to come in, and maybe using some of these resources as your tools 
to train the families or to give families information of what your expectations will be. So that was one of the reasons, too, I wanted to add that into the slide as well as on bullet three, thinking about the staff and what all the staff has had to go through and um, how they've had to make adjustments and, and continuing as you have in the past, but continuing to be that strong support system for them. I found this slide and I thought it to be would be very useful now as again, you may be able to step back just a little bit and do some planning for the future and thinking about uh, what all has happened, what all has occurred from March, uh, February, March until this time. Uh, hard to believe that we're almost to October, but we've had this many months to uh, really learn a lot of lessons. And so uh, this is some PPE or personal protective equipment planning strategies. You can look at your capacity uh, and think about how many masks and gloves and um, gowns, face shields, goggles, how many uh, resources have you gone through during this time? And those unsurmountable numbers as they have grown higher and higher. So now maybe if you could, you know, get to that point where, you know, you're kind of in some uh, planning stages, divide it up maybe into a conventional capacity, which is things that should already be in place. Uh, we could not have planned for what we all have just been through since March, but you know, what you normally would have in stock and thinking about what you've gone through and where your stock might need to be some contingency capacities uh, that can be used during periods of anticipated PPE shortages. We don't know what this fall is going to bring as uh, flu season begins. And so really putting some things in as far as contingency uh, right now might be a good idea. And then uh, crisis capacity, and I really looked at the asterisks on here to say not commensurate with U.S. standards of care. We didn't know that this is where many were going to be back in the beginning or the first quarter and second quarter of the year. And so, you know, just really beginning to take and absorb what was used, how it was used, and, you know, how it could be effectively used in the future. And then I know that a lot of you used a burn rate calculator during this time. But I want to bring your attention back to it, and as you see in the top of right-hand corner, I've added our website, www.alliantquality.org. We actually have a burn rate calculator out there as well as the CDC site, uh, but we wanted to make it easy for you to go out and click on it and um, maybe download it to your desktop or to your documents and be able to have that available to really use it and think through, you know, what you have used and help that maybe use it as a tool to help you maybe in the future to make sure that your inventory is where it needs to be. I think most people would say, you know, we don't need everybody hoarding right now, but yet you want your inventory to be able to be to a, a um, capacity so that you would be able to start taking care of residents should anything occur and you start having uh, more positive cases. We hope that's not going to be the case, but this tool can help you as an indicator for what you've used and help you do some predictions maybe for the future. I'm sure that several of you have used all of these um, training sessions, but I want to bring them back to your attention to keep them on the forefront of your mind. Uh, sparkling service surfaces, uh, there's no telling how many uh, hits they have had to this to be able to use, uh, how, how to clean and disinfect. Again, we are possibly, you know, moving towards flu season right now, and so this might be a good uh, educational tool to bring back out of your toolbox for your staff. Uh, clean hands and maybe keeping COVID out and PTE lessons, you might consider using those as you begin to allow family visits and giving them some uh, links as you send letters out to let them know how the visits are going to go, just to be more prepared for that time and to be more prepared for, you know, making sure that everything goes as seamlessly as it possibly can while continuing to reiterate to your staff, you know, the very the necessities of to continue on with the, the plans and the progress that you have all made over these past few months. 
And so, again, you will have all of these links. On this particular slide, I have condensed them down to where you can just click on a, a couple of links. Some folks also have talked about maybe using some of the, the videos on the YouTube channel uh, and putting them out in their nursing home. So um, not only do, are your staff hearing this uh, every day, but the residents can hear it going throughout the building. But this could also be a tool to be used when you know, folks are coming in and making visits uh, during these next few months. So I want to introduce, uh, not only, you, you've heard me now for a few minutes talking, but I want to introduce the rest of my team, and that is the Infection Control and Patient Safety Team. Many of you have reached out to Marilee Johnson. She's our technical advisor for infection prevention, but she is also our NHSN guru. And so she has helped a few hundred people or a few hundred technical assistance times to get folks reporting and enrolled to report their COVID, not only COVID, but other things as well in the NHSN. So I would like to, uh, so that you will have her email address. So if you have any issues around the reporting for COVID, uh, she is our go-to and our technical advisor. And as of last week, we introduced Amy Ward to our team, and she is going to serve as our infection prevention specialist. So we hope to have Amy on some of these calls as we go through the future and uh, some of our Learning in Action Network events, but know that we are here to serve you from an infection control standpoint as much as we possibly can. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, at least two nursing homes that I have found are doing a, a really great job of um, implementing some best practices. Unfortunately, Teresa and Sabrina could not be with us from Sadie G. Mays, but they were so gracious this morning as they called and said that they had uh, something to come up to give me some bullet points to actually share with you on how they have implemented a buddy system in their nursing home. So if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'd like to read through this for you and give you some information of setting up a buddy system. Uh, the buddy system program was set up due to staff wearing their mask incorrectly or wearing a cloth mask when not appropriate. Management team noticed the staff responded well when other peers asked them to put their mask on or asked that you have your N95 mask. And so they developed a motto for um, Sadie G. Mays, and that motto with the buddy system is that everyone is responsible for all staff members and our residents. Any staff member is now empowered to ask for folks to wear their masks appropriately and properly, and it doesn't matter what department you work in, all departments are empowered to uh, question if you have the right mask on or you're wearing it appropriately. They also created a champion on each shift, and that champion is in charge of overseeing the PPE supplies on each unit, and they conduct rounds to ensure that the staff and residents are wearing the appropriate PPE as well as wearing their mask per their policy and appropriately. Last but not least, they informed us today that their buddy system has worked quite well for the facility with the peers and having peers to be empowered, to be able to ask questions and question when a mask is not being worn, either the correct mask or being worn appropriately. They're happy to report that they have no COVID in their building. And they also, uh, one of the things that they're doing is to provide a uh, mask with um, five to 10 N95 masks weekly and when needed or when they need to make changes. So I'm sorry that they were not able, they would have done a much better job at giving you their story, but I tell you this and had asked them to share their story to know that that peer-to-peer, -peer, um, as I have talked with them, seems to have just really turned some of their PPE programs around so that the, the staff feels more comfortable, but yet they're empowered also to make sure that the right thing's being done all of the time out on their um their floors at their nursing home. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Greg Heath and Patricia or Patty Comer from AG Rhodes, Wesley Woods, and they're going to tell us about audits. I've mentioned that earlier, and I gave a couple of scenarios of when audits would be effective, but I've asked uh, them to share their journey and their story 
about how they have actually used audits appropriately and effectively. So Greg and Patty, the floor is yours. All right, good afternoon, right. everyone. Good afternoon, thank you so much, Melody, for allowing us to be a part of this. Um, as Melody just said, my name is Patty Comer. I'm the Director of Nursing here at AG Rhodes Wesley Woods. And our facility was selected to participate in a targeted response quality improvement initiative with Alliant related to infection control, which is how we really started our, our journey. Uh, to give a background, our facility's QAPI team, which is made up of our facility uh, department heads, opened a COVID impact QAPI at the end of March to help us address all the new COVID-19 infection control policies and of course all the regulatory and governmental requirements that we had to have to ensure that our facility was meeting the new standards of care in regards to everything COVID-19. In July of uh, 20, prior to meeting for the first time with Melody at the beginning of August, I had asked my QAPI team to start doing weekly infection control audits as part of our QAPI project. These audits were to be done within their departments to, de to identify any breaks in infection control policies and protocols with these specific areas, hand hygiene, donning and doffing PPE, social distancing, wearing a mask, and proper placement of the mask to include covering the mouth and the nose. I asked them to choose five people per week in their department to audit and to turn in their reports to me every Friday. And everybody really was on board to do it. I was really happy to see that they all wanted to participate. I instructed them, I told them not to carry a clipboard and not to look like the COVID police, but to use these audits as an opportunity for learning and to promote better practices and compliance in our, in our facility. It did not take long to realize that we had a problem, however, because everybody's audit came back with a perfect report. Every box on the audit tool was checked with a cookie cutter yes response. Melody guided us to realize that this approach was not giving us accurate data. We decided to try a new approach, which was really our success. And that was to have our nursing management, which included our shift supervisors on all three shifts, to start doing the weekly audits to include observations of all employee departments but with an objective critical eye to what was really going on, right or wrong, and to identify teaching moments to re-educate staff on proper techniques. I also told the department heads to continue their audits, but, it, but guided them to really look at this differently, not, as, not like as a friend in their department, but to really look at it as, as an opportunity to help each other grow and to have better compliance to protect each other and the residents. Yeah. Because none of it was meant to be punitive. We were all just trying to do the right thing. Right. So the first thing we noticed when we started doing the, the audits objectively is that we had a lot of problems with masks and donning and doffing of PPE, especially on our observation unit, which is where we have our, you know, possible suspected cases, mostly uh, new admits or readmits. Um, we use these opportunities to stop the staff member exactly at the time that the improper technique was noticed, and without being punitive, as Greg just said, we used coaching and guide, guidance to help um, the staff member realize the proper thing to do. We immediately found champions in our nursing department that were our secret sauce, and we were able to monitor the PPE and mask compliance behind the scenes on a day-to-day -day basis. So these champions were just, you know, part of the everyday um, staffing uh, pattern, but they were, they really were our secret sauce. They were our champions. They were our, they were our informal leaders. Um, I just want to say that it's really important to identify and elevate your rock stars in your building to empower them to help you with your efforts. Um, my rehab team immediately identified one of the PTAs as being a champion, and they made him a PPE coach, which is a new word, but a very effective one to, to have somebody who can really show someone and be a role model for doing the right thing. Um, these audits, I, this is kind of a funny little story I wanted to share. These audits also helped us find other unrelated incidental issues related to PPE. Uh, on one day I was doing an audit on our um, 
on our observation area and I found one of our very tall PTAs, he's 6'7", he had on one of the gowns that we, um, one of our reusable gowns, but it was... No, it was a disposable. It was a disposable. Like most of us are using, and um, as some of you uh, I'm sure realize is that basically these days we get what's shipped to us, so sometimes sizes aren't an option. Um, and we were out of extra large gowns, and this gentleman was wearing, uh, it looked like a medium, but I'm sure it was at least a large, but anyway, go ahead. So yeah, just, just noting those kind of things, um, you know, like the gown was up to his waist and, the, and the, the sleeves were up to the forearms, so certainly it wasn't, it, it wasn't a proper application of PPE, but that's where audits can also come in handy too, to find things that you wouldn't normally think of that are just out there, but definitely need to be addressed. The last thing I want to share is that we did have a complaint survey come out on 9-2, which was, what, two weeks ago. And the surveyor, who just was peeking through my observation uh, hall, my little movable wall window, she saw a CNA that was at the linen closet with her N95 down under her nose. And the surveyor motioned the CNA over to her, and the surveyor herself used it as a teachable moment. Um, I was very touched by her compassion actually for this CNA who shared that she just couldn't breathe. She was trying to get a breath in between rooms uh, and she was struggling that day. Um, she wasn't in the residence room, which I think is what gave us the save, but um, I just wanted to really uh, kind of highlight that we do have to listen and gently guide each other during these very challenging and difficult times because it is difficult to um, to navigate all these new rules and requirements that we have to follow. Yeah. And I thank you all so much. Anything else, Greg? Um, now, the only thing I would like to um, add to that is, um, well, two things, the buddy system and the audits, as you can see, I think Patty's uh, presentation uh, sort of lined up with uh, Sadie G. May's presentation as well. Um, but I will tell you that when we initially started our journey in March, um, the fear factor was there. and uh, the staff were, were super anxious, all of us were, um, uh, on, on the whole process, and that's when they were at their best um, complying with the proper PPE requirements. Um, and then we hit, like most of us have, uh, a, a downtime to where we all those cases were resolved, and then we went six, eight weeks without any cases, um, although we were getting new admits. Um, and as Patty said, they go into the observation unit, and the staff had a mentality that, um, that the residents were tested in the hospital, um, and then they were tested before they were discharged to us, which uh, at least we were um, requiring or at least uh, uh, favorably asking for a negative test on discharge. So the staff had it in their minds that the folks that we had in observations were clear because they were just tested. Um, and then, as most of you know, uh, those uh, requirements kind of shifted and the hospitals aren't necessarily doing that exit uh, COVID test um, on, on, before discharge and we're assuming that they all could potentially have it on a MIT, uh, but their behaviors didn't change. So they had a comfort level um, with minimal cases, if not any new cases, and then all observation. And I think we uh, kind of slid back um, and didn't realize how far back we slid until we started doing our or PPE audits on a more regular basis. So uh, certainly something to keep in mind that you get you get to a comfort level and that's when things kind of um, break down on you. And, and like I said, initially, uh, the fear factor was probably one of our, our best uh, assets that we had to try to get through this um, on the front side. Thank you, Greg and Patty. I greatly appreciate you sharing your secret sauce at AG Rose with us today. And I hope that having these two peer sharings and opportunities to hear a couple of best practices for everyone was very beneficial. We did have a question in the Q&A of where you both were located. Both nursing homes are located in Georgia near the uh, metro Atlanta area, or, or I think, Greg, y'all would say that you're in the metro Atlanta area. So yes, Julie, if, But thank y'all very much again for your presentation. and. Uh, all of the lessons learned that, that you have shared with us today. As I have mentioned many times during this presentation, here is the resource page, so you'll have this available for you to use. And uh, 
just a click away from all of the resources that have been shared today, in addition, giving you the opportunity to go back and maybe relook at some of the resources that you've been using and make sure that uh, the updates are always current for you and a readily available for not only your leadership but your staff as well. All right, well, if you will wrap us up, then thank you all very much. If you do have questions, please feel free to uh, reach out to myself or even Julie Keeker. And Julie, if you'll wrap us up. I will. And thank you everyone for attending. Our next in the series will be September 30th and our topic is going to be environmental hygiene. And just remember all of these are recorded. We have a YouTube channel where you can go back and listen to these later. We also have a presence on Facebook and Twitter. So make sure to engage with us because we are here, as Melody said, to make this journey easier for you. Thank you for attending and I I am sure we'll see you again on September 30th for our next in the series for the Infinity Group Educational Quickeners. Thank you and have a good day.